Good afternoon. Um, so I'm Jen Person. We are a digital rights organisation coming from the UK, and we operate primarily in England, but I have the privilege of being part of a working group at the Council of Europe on Artificial Intelligence and Education, and I supported the um, Committee on Convention 108, the Council of Europe Data Protection Committee, to develop guidelines for data protection and education in 2019 and 2020. So most of my talk will be focused on the practical aspects of what ed tech means for children, especially with a focus in England. But I can answer questions and also think to the slightly bigger picture. So I'll tie together a little bit of what we talked about already this morning. What does it mean when we talk about the digital environment and education? Now, there are already guidelines about this around the world, including the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, General Comment Number 25, which talked about the rights of the child in the digital environment. What's often forgotten is that many of these rights are dependent on what is not digital. And that general comment is a really useful, big, overarching document to talk about the big picture of education, its aims, what is education for, what is children's rights about, and where does it fit in into the big picture. When we talk about privacy in education, we also often talk, think, when we talk in relation to the digital environment, we narrow the thinking of privacy to the question of data protection. I would challenge you this afternoon to think about more than data protection when we think about privacy. And I will come on to that as we look at the emerging technologies in the ed tech sector. Privacy has been enshrined in law and in general documents around the world since the UN Declaration on Human Rights in 1948. Arbitrary interference. That is not a simple idea. If you ask people what is your notion of privacy, lots of people in the room will come up with different perspectives. But for me, the key point when we're talking about the child, the child in education who is learning, developing, and growing into adulthood, the question is who can influence that child and what does interference mean? Now we talk about ed tech and education at a critical point, I think, in a, a quite a unique point. David Beasley, the head of the World Food Programme, came out and said, we had a perfect storm before Ukraine. He's concerned about world food production because of COVID climate and conflict. This is the backdrop against which we currently are making choices. And again, this is the second thing I'd ask you to think about this afternoon. Which choices are we making for children and on behalf of children when they are disempowered to make their own. In 2020, we mapped a typical day in the life of an 11-year-old child in England. And I would like to take you through some of that because these are the choices we have made, perhaps not actively, in the English education system. A child will start their school day at seven o'clock They'll perhaps get a text message from their school on their phone or their parents will to tell them about something going on in the school day. That's a company that's outsourced, a private commercial company that has parents' information and children's information to be able to con for the school to be able to interact and do homeschool communications. As a child goes into the school, in England we have increasingly adopted CCTV and cameras in the playground in body cameras and crossings, and in the classroom. Registration systems are centralized. About 15 providers of UK um, schools information management systems sell their products to schools, who then store all the children's personal information in commercialized proprietary systems. These are then accessed by government through interoperable systems to extract that information increasingly often. It used to be once a term, that was three times a year. The government in the UK has started a, uh, collecting attendance data, whether the child is in school or not, every two to four hours. You can ask yourself whether that is necessary or proportionate. But as we go through the day, children in England are increasingly datafied. Everything they do on a digital platform is monitored through web monitoring companies. These can be uh, 
operate in all sorts of different ways. Some operate in conjunction with the school, some are independent and will monitor children's activity online, what they type, what they store, what they, what they search for, even what they delete can be recorded, and keywords are flagged for children's risk. Now, companies decide what those risks are. They could be risks of harm to themselves, self-harm, harm to others, like bullying, or harm from others, like grooming. And increasingly, child protection is seen as a necessary tool to package around digital tools as a layer on top. The children will be later in the day being logging on to Microsoft, Google, and others. Particularly in the UK, it was the two companies that got extra special funding access uh, for schools in the pandemic. In the canteens at lunchtime, we increasingly have used biometrics. We were one of the first countries since 2001 to start using biometric fingerprint technologies, commonly in schools, for interactions with cashless payment systems. Children also use the biometric system to even borrow a library book, so as a form of identification. Apps are multitudinous. They can be used for all sorts of things, but some will track behavior, so that the teacher can interact with the child and say, you did something great, wonderful, we'll record positive points, or not, negative points, often using color-coded schemes like traffic lights. These apps can be accessed often by parents as well. And then there's teaching and learning apps. Now this may be one of the first times we've talked about teaching and learning. So much of ed tech in the UK is particularly focused around administration. But teaching and learning apps can be used for perhaps filling in a few minutes at the start or end of a lesson in maths, do a quick quiz, test what the child knows, or increasingly used for homework. Artificial intelligence platforms are also being emerging and some will claim to be able to personalize learning. That is a theme we've been exploring at the Council of Europe Working Group, and it is a contested question whether personalized means personalized to you or whether often it means learners like you, massive amounts of data being used to offer similar patterns of learning in, in what other children like you have done. How personal is that really? And then by the end of the day, a child will find that all of these data in different companies can be either siloed into each of these individual proprietary companies and or collected, as we see in the center, for all these types of administration reasons that the school has and why they store a centralized record, record about of a child. So what do you see in this? The volume of actors. Now we saw earlier this morning that wide range of network, the spider diagram. That's all going on behind the scenes. All these companies who are uh, collecting information, processing it, storing it, retaining it, we don't know for how long, all goes on behind the scenes. The children only interact with the ring on the outside of this day. How is an 11-year-old possibly meant to understand how many companies they are interacting with, if at all? The surveillance this involves, the data valence, as Ben Williamson and Deborah Lupton called it in their paper in 2016, is increasing and it's vast in the UK. And it's increasingly meant the weakening, if not total loss of homeschool boundaries. What gets monitored in school has now also shifted to home. So if a child has logged onto the school network, their activity is monitored no matter where they are 24 seven, 365 days a year. So the question of privacy is really not a realistic question almost anymore, but the confidentiality of data should be a professional question we should challenge ourselves to ask. It's one that is increasingly difficult in proprietary systems held by multiple actors. There are questions of accessibility and design. How accessible are these for different children of neurodiverse conditions, of different disabilities, of different learning abilities? What are the health and safety standards that apply to every tool? Here in the UK, at least for us, there are none. Anyone can basically start up an EdTech app and sell it or give it away for free, which is a very common way of accessing schools. And data distribution, whether to these companies on, from the school to the company knowingly, or whether from the companies to third parties afterwards, is enormous. We have 
for example, um, talked with a company that looks to parents to be quite a small app. It measures their child's reading ability in the, in the classroom. And if a child borrows a book, they can do a book report, and that information is stored, and they get points to say, we've achieved certain numbers of books and reading this year. There's questions around how does the company decide to score those books? Why does a, um, you know, a certain type of George Orwell book get higher or fewer points than a Harry Potter? The company decides. How is that influencing how a child chooses which books to read? Is a question most people don't ask. But that company, in fact, is owned by private equity based in the Cayman Islands not something that parents would ever think their child would have interacted with when they send their child to school each day. And this, I think, is the fundamental question. Why do children go to school? They go to exercise their right to education. But increasingly, emerging technologies are adding to what you might think of as a normal day. They're becoming more intrusive and more invasive. We've got the bio biometrics, as I said, are common from fingerprints. Now increasingly voice is being recorded in the classroom. Eye activity being monitored for concentration. Same as brain scanners you've seen in China where parents pushed back on them for monitoring concentration. Facial recognition and detection. Cameras even in the classrooms in the UK starting to test mood detection by, based on facial detection. And gait analysis and RFID tracking more intrusive as the emerging technologies are testing the boundaries of what's possible. So what happens to rights, I think one of the colleagues will come on to more later this afternoon as we're short of time, but I think it matters to think not only about the right to education in this sector, but what does it mean for the wider rights of the full entitlement of human rights? Children enjoy special protections and rights as children. As the Commissioner for Human Rights at the launch of the new uh, Council of Europe strategy for the rights of the child said uh, quite recently, they are full rights holders. And in the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights, we must remember that no one right tri trumps another. Rights are indivisible, inalienable, and interdependent. But let's come back to the idea of the privacy, that the child has a right to protection of the law against interference. Emerging technologies are pushing the boundaries of this much further. Freedom to think, confidentiality, are questioned and challenged by apps and technology that measure mood or attentiveness or concentration. We've got artificial intelligence that claims to be able to measure your uh, mental health based on quiz questions that you answer. Deletions, things, things that children have typed into search engines are still being recorded and monitored and may trigger flags. Where is the child's privacy in terms of how they have freedom to think? And as child developing, that's incredibly important. The freedom of association and privacy is something we don't often think about in education. But again, these emerging technologies are pushing the boundaries of this to measure intent. What do we look like we're about to do? What does our mood suggest we're about to react? How might behaviors be measured? Privacy and identity in education is challenged by the administration tools, again, using increasingly using biometrics, access controls, voice analysis, and teaching analytics. So all of these emerging technologies are challenging the law on defining what is biometrics, because biometrics in law is defined as the ability to identify an individual. And often they're not interested in being able to identify the individual. It's the ability to profile and, beha and measure behavior and base predictions on it that's becoming increasingly important. So as you look to develop new guidelines, there are existing ones that may be of use, but all of these, I think, are still being challenged as we look at what is the real basis of um, the child's reason for being in education. We have to think not only about the, the rights of the child in terms of their ability to access education, but also the aims of education. The aims of education set out in the UNCRC Article 29, the very first general comment that the UN, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child Committee set out, 
was about the aims of education to promote and support the, and protect the dignity and in equal and inalienable rights of the child to be able to flourish into adulthood. So we should need to think not only about the child as an individual, but how we are influencing their development. And also then, as we look towards the future, think about how their development is being influenced by these other actors around the world. We talked this morning about sovereignty, about the influence of um, big tech and the uh, f funding of, of education. We need to think about who is learning while children learn. What are these companies taking away to understand the big picture of education? What power does that give them to influence not only the child, but the state sector and the state's delivery of education? And the cost of this, as companies that may be free today may start charging tomorrow, what will that mean for the future ability to deliver education at state level? And who will control that? Ultimately, we need to remember the aims of education should be directed to the full development of the human personality and strengthening the respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. And perhaps it is no more timely than now to remember it's also about promoting the understanding, tolerance and friendship among all nations. Thank you.